Hi, hello everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Annalisa Rosso and I'm especially glad to introduce here today architect Alejandro Aravena. Thank you for being here. Um, Alejandro has been invited to be part of the Open Talks project, uh, the program curated by Maria Cristina Didero for Super Salone. And uh, you know, she's really sorry not to be here and uh, welcome you, but she just gave birth to twins. So she, she say hello to everybody and thank you for being here again. Uh, just a couple of uh, words to introduce uh, Alejandro. Alejandro, as uh, uh, everybody knows, curated uh, in uh, 2016 Elemental, the Biennale of Architecture in Venice. He won in 2008 uh, the Leone d'Argento, again at Biennale in Venice. And in 2016, he has uh, been the Pritzker Prize. Um, I just want to spoil something that is very interesting. Please be very um, careful to the to this lecture because Alejandro will open uh, the questions to the public not at the end of the speech but uh, during his presentation. So I'm very happy to give you the word and uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you. So. Um very happy to be physically here. It's one of the things that has become a luxury. Um, it was always important to physically meet. One is to exchange information, another, another thing is to com communicate. And I guess that communication is what needed the moment you're stepping out into unknown fields. Uh, and that being by nature what work is about. Design is about the blank page. You're always making that jump into the void of the, what's not already known. Um, and for that communication, it's crucial. Of course, information is needed, but communication, it's crucial. And that is not verbal necessarily. That's why the physical presence matters so much. And uh, that's why also being aware of the importance of the uh, meeting personally I didn't want this to be a lecture. Lectures can be done over Zoom. What happens here, the, the interaction, it's, it's something, that, it's the way I would like to make it, take advantage of the precious amount of time that we were given. So the idea here is to start with a, a provocation, which is a, a short video uh, do we have a, a QR code already in the, in the screen of the project that we're presenting at the Venice Biennale? If, you're, if you can scan this, this is a, a nine-minute version of the project that we're presenting at the Biennale to address the question of how we will live together. It's about uh, one, the exploration of a possible path for finding a way to peacefully find a way to live together between Chileans and Mapuche, that uh, right now is, is one of the most pressing challenges that we're facing, um, among others, among pandemic and among, among the social and political uh, blast that we had uh, almost two years ago, this being the third one that is, is challenging us as a society in Chile. So, uh, but this is a nine minute version. Uh, what we're going to see here is the, the sneak peek that was asked by the Biennale, the three-minute version. And uh, once that is done, I'm going to go back to a couple of, of remarks about the project. And right after, I would like you to ask questions. What do you want to know? Whatever kind of thing, not necessarily about this project. Uh, so it's going to be more of a conversation more than anything else. Uh, so already begin to, to think about what would you like to ask? So can, can we start with uh, the three minute video, please? Mapuche and Chileans have always been in conflict. At the core, is the question of the land. One possible clue to understand the complexity of the issue 
may be given by the fact that in Spanish we don't have two words for land and earth. So we have tended to mix, as if it was the same thing, the dispute over the land, its ownership and the historical property rights, with a deeper notion of earth as planet. Be it for legal or cultural reasons, the fact is that violence has escalated. So, how we will live together? First, by getting to know each other. The Kunu intends to use architecture as a portal to the Mapuche world. Once the field is leveled, let's start a conversation. The Coyahue is a place that intends to reinstall the old tradition of polis. Puede ser un camino, no estamos diciendo que ese un camino, puede ser una Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, the, the nine-minute version that have some clues of how we answered that question is in this QR code. Uh, but before jumping into that answer, um, I would like to, to, to focus on the question that Sarkis raised in the Biennale in Venice. How will we live together? I think that... The more I think about it, this is the question of our times. I don't think there's a more important question than this one. Uh, and Sarkis should be given as many awards as possible for just raising this question. What then is in the Biennale, uh, it's secondary to the capacity he had to have understood even before the pandemic that this would be the question that we would be facing as, as a societies, as communities, and that we as architects may have, to have, to have something to say about it. Interestingly enough, before coming here last week, exactly one week ago on September 1st, I was invited to the Constitutional Convention in Chile you know, Chile, we are rewriting our constitution. The reason of that is two years ago, there was this social political explosion in a country that in principle should have been an example in Latin America for economic development, for, for many achievements, yet the anger, the resentment, the inequality, the abuses of a, of a system that has been re regarded as unfair produce such such a tension, such a, a the, the, again, it exploded in a way that many people didn't see coming. Uh, to the point that the, the peaceful solution to come out of this problem was by rewriting the constitution. The rules of the game that may eventually, it's not guaranteed, allow us as a society to be able to live together again. Who on earth would have thought that in the first invitation to an outsider because the, the Constitutional Convention has been defining the rules of the game for how the rewriting of the Constitution will take place, 
would be an architect. And I started the presentation over, th over there by saying, how will we live together in Spanish? ¿Cómo vamos a vivir juntos? Is the question I thought they as a convention have. And it just happens that we as architects face that same question in front of the bank blank page every single time. How will a family live together in a house? A group of families in a passage of in a building. Those families in a neighborhood, in a city, or in a territory. I guess that the pandemic, the whatever type of inequalities you may be living under, or the uh, environmental emergency that we're living, has brought, in a very brutal way, the debate between the individual and the collective. The, the balance or the unbalance of something that until very recent was a kind of obvious goal and legitimate goal that you fulfill your own dream. Your, your projects in life, moving from A to B, well, that now is not necessarily that something that you just can follow because it may affect the common good. And that threat on the common good may may put a big question mark on your own project. So I guess that the moment we have to answer that question or how we will live together, and that, that was the, the speech I gave there, is that while dealing with the, our own projects, we have distilled some clues that may be useful for the convention's work of having to answer the same question. So I guess that Going back to the Biennale, how will we live together? I can't think of a more important, visionary, timely question than that. I can't also, can't also think of a more difficult question than that. A lot of knowledge and wisdom may, will be required and the risk of making proposals, not just analysis and diagnosis. We will have to risk the blank page over and over again. And, um, and again, may, maybe that is uh, the, the lens through which I would look at whatever your interests are in here while raising your own questions. The thing is that, how do I know that this is the most important question of our times? Because maybe from a year now, I've been testing how to speak to different environments outside Chile, to people that are non-architects. And, and whenever I started with this question, how we will live together, people immediately understand that it's their own problem as well. And, and this has been in an empirical, not theoretical, a very pragmatical test. People, that, a society that will rewrite the rules of their uh, existence together, like in a political convention or in a different country, all of us have been, and all, they, all, of our, all of them have been systematically reacting as if it was their own question, this one. And, and this is why I, I think that it, it will be a lasting question uh, and an important contribution of, uh, of, the, of Sarkis and the Biennale to the type of challenges that we're facing as, as uh, practitioners and professionals. So, that being said, the, the, I maybe use a PowerPoint, it's not clear if I'm going to use it. I, I prefer to, to understand what are you interested in at, uh, and, and that way move, move ahead. But if not, we can also leave it here. Who has some remarks, question? So what do we do with the mic, sorry? Do, do I pass it? Oh, over there. I think the, the, the example about the, um, what happened in Chile, I think it's, it's mind-blowing in, in my opinion. Like, after two years of pandemic, like, the idea of changing the constitution that in here, like in Italy, is one of the things that nobody has ever touched, as if it's some sort of milestone, uh, I think should make us think a lot. And I think... The idea of changing is today, I don't know, one of the crucial points, I mean, regarding the, 
the, the, the main topic of Biennale. And I, I maybe want to ask you, why are we so much afraid as architects, as designers, as human beings of a real change? Like, is it possible that today, after whatever happened, anytime we are looking for a real change, we're scared? And I'm not speaking about fashion. I'm not speaking today is blue and tomorrow is red. I'm speaking about deep changes as much as the constitutional uh, Congress, I mean, did in Chile. And yes. Yes, I, I'm, and I, I would, again, who would uh, underline fear. Um, that's a very real question, and, and we're, we're very fearful as a society as well. I mean, it's not guaranteed that we will be succeed in creating... Actually, many people, particularly... I mean, if, if this was originated by inequalities, and inequalities is not just an economical thing, uh, it, it's... It's cultural, it's racial, it's, uh, and of course, economical as well. Uh, but the, the real inequalities uh, tend also to be not only measurable, but intangible as, as well. And um, the symbolic dimension of inequalities are part of the equation, and that's why it's such a difficult question. Emotions are at the very core of of the question of the built environment. The moment we come to live together in cities, of course there's that rational decisions, access to jobs, education, it's efficient to deliver public policies, and there are many advantages, but what is triggered immediately when we begin to live together are the emotional, from the desire to be together with others, you know, the desire to meet, to look at others, that's why I guess you are still coming here to the Fiera. Uh, but also the fear, I mean, it's, it's the other one a threat. I mean, what the pandemic triggered is that it moved from the advantages of meeting others as a way to move ahead of progress, it, the others became a threat, not to mention what it means immigration and, and all that. So again, emotions are part of the question. That being said, it's not clear, and part of the Chilean society is, is fearful, particularly those in the inequality uh, curve, the ones that were up, well, will my privileges be, will disappear in this? Will be all be leveled down? So that if somebody, some had, and there were some other have nots, well, now we'll, we'll be all have nots. That's the biggest fear, I would say, that of, of what we will lose. What I, I don't know the, how it will come out. What I do know, though, is that to have opened the question to this was the only way to be able to keep on having the possibility to be living together. If we didn't open this question, the amount of anger and resentment and violence would, would, would have made it impossible to live together. It's, it's when you have a wound that you don't want to open, well, you want to quickly cover it, well, you may have all the undesired things just covered visually, yet inside they're poisoning you. So we have to open the wound even though it hurts. And it's, there's a, some media pressure uh, to put the convention as if it was something bad, that uh, this is not succeeding, and of course it's full of noise. There are full of examples that are saying that this is going to fail. Yet, being, having been there a week ago, my instinct, my intuitive uh, reaction was that this is the way, this is the path. And uh, what I did there was to share some clues that we have found while delivering the built environment. One of them, and I guess that the Mapuche project was the, the ninth project, and I will very quickly have a, a quick explanation about the video because from the conflict may be given some clue. It's, it's counterintuitive because you will never go to a conflict to take out lessons to resolve a conflict, yet in what we learned in, the, in doing the project of, with, the, with this uh, a forest company and a Mapuche community that decided 10 years ago to approach each other. Uh, there are some clues here. One of the clues is 
I would call it the address the elephant in the room. What, what you're saying about the fear of why don't we ask structural fundamental questions? Well, one of the things that we have learned in participatory design is that if you don't address the elephant in the room, then there's not legitimacy. The, one of the most important uh, attributes that will be part of the answer for how we will live together is that we come up with a, with a constitution that is, that is legitimate. For now, we have a constitution that is legal, but legal is not enough. It has to be legitimate. In order to be legitimate, things had, had to be discussed in a very open way, even the uncomfortable questions. If we don't do that, we will have, again, a weak set of rules that will be only guarantee a kind of bureaucratic administrative issues, but not the deeper notion of being able, being able to live together. And that may, at the beginning, be rather cathartic. It, it won't be an easy project. But it's not that different from what we encounter while doing projects, particularly for underserved communities. When you're dealing with people that are homeless, well, the first meetings uh, it's not that some that you're uploaded by coming there with a project. Normally, you receive a lot of anger and resentment because they're not being able to identify who is who. They blame on you why they have been suffering such unfair living conditions for such a long time. It is part of the process of, of being able to have that moment of being hurt, finally, at the beginning. And that, I guess, is in, in unequal societies, that's very important. Uh, what we learned, the other thing that we learned in this process, and you, it may explain a bit why in, in the video, particularly in the nine minute version, these are actually two projects, not just one. One built in the southern part of the country, it's called the Kunu, and another one is the one that is built in Venice, that is the Koyawe. We thought at the beginning of this project that well, another clue that may, may, may be important for answering the question. The Mapuche conflict is so charged. It's so, it, it comes from the beginning of the times, from the formation of the Republic, that whenever you ask somebody that, uh, what is the problem about, that answer is biased. So the first thing we did when invited to translate into a concrete project this rapprochement between these two parties a decade ago and two years ago, they say, okay, whatever we have, we have found as possibilities of, of peaceful rapprochement instead of just fighting, the other way of, of, of engaging in, a, in an interaction is through violence. That's the old violence from the police or the military or violence from very extremism, uh, extremist groups. The, that's the only way they interact right now. Is there a path, a possible path for a peaceful interaction? And this is a question that we have been trying to translate into a proposal. At the beginning, we thought we had to do a project in, and, and again, sorry, because it, it has these very important steps that we have found over in, in doing this. So instead of just going into and, and, and assuming that we knew about the project, the first thing we, do, we did was to unlearn whatever we thought we knew about the Mapuche. So we were taught at schools that Mapuche used to be whatever. It's, it's a, a verb in the past. They're not even called in the textbooks at school, they're not even called Mapuche. They're called Araucanos. And Araucanos is the name that Spaniards gave to the Mapuche in a way, as a way to erase their identity. Mapu, Earth, Che, people. So in our textbooks at school, they're not even called Mapuche, they're called Araucanos. So we had to unlearn whatever we, we, we learned at school to even go into the question and only then try to understand something. We, the second condition we asked for doing the project was to go directly into the territory and the process of immersion in the territory. And once we did that, of course, the first meetings, can, can we go to the the PowerPoint number one, please. Oh, I, I may have to. Yeah, the, actually that, that picture over there, you see only the big one? Yeah, to, to, to the right. That was the first meeting 
uh, it was an extremely tense meeting. Uh, first 15 minutes in Mapudungun, not even in Spanish. So for, for 15 minutes, we didn't understand, and it was our problem not to understand. To that point, you could feel the, the tension, in, the bodily, bodily tension. Uh, some tipping point became when we asked about the traditional sport, the palin. So the conversation abandoned the head. It, be, it became physical. Uh, the moment it became physical, with all the risks that that uh, carried, you, you move into a different mode that is, again, it's, it's, it's tactile, it's, uh, it's it, the physical presence and you can't understand, you can't maybe get part of it, it's not becomes physical. I mean, it was not a plan, it just happened like that and that's something we understood later on. Um, but again, in, in, the, in this process of, of getting to know each other, and this may be the important thing, they already had a project. I'm going to stop over there. Just, no, no, not there. Maybe there. One of the things we learned after unlearning what we thought we knew about the Mapuche was to remember Mapuche used to have um, a device, an institution to deal with controversies. It was the parlis, the Coyactun. I don't, the, I, for the Biennale, I was trying to translate parli, parlamento, in Italian. But the word you have for parlamento is already the political parlamento. It's, a, it's already a formal institution. This is before that, when, when you come together to find an agreement or to get, uh, to exchange gifts, that kind of, so it's a, it's a basic first uh, knowledge kind of thing. When you, you don't even share the language, so the parlis, the coyactun, is something the Mapuche had. They used to help parlis with the Inca Empire and before the Spaniards. Then they held parlis with the Spanish crown as a way to find agreements. Then they had parlis even with the Chilean Re Republic in the 1800 when the Chilean Republic was created. So there was this institution of the parlis and we thought, well, isn't the parlis an institution that should be recovered, again, as a, as a way to deal with controversies. So we thought at the beginning that, okay, here we have something, let's jump and, and create the architecture for a parley. The, the, that architecture didn't exist. I don't know if there is uh, one particular engraving. It might not be here. No, just, just there, it's fine. There was no architecture for the parties. It was just a meeting in the territory. So our challenge was, can we create an architecture for this institution of, of negotiating conflicts? As if it had always existed there, even though it never existed. That was a cha the architectural challenge we had. But when we thought that that was going to be our task, one academic, one lady, a Mapuche academic that teaches at the Universidad de Chile, she said, but interesting that you are thinking of recovering that tradition of the parlis, the Coyactun. It, it's very interesting. But you know, there was one condition for the parlis, a minimum symmetry of knowledge between the parties that are, were going to sit to negotiate. If they, these two societies, whatever, Incas, Spanish, or Chileans, don't know each other, then that coming onto the table of negotiations, it's going to be uh, unleveled. So before going into the parley, there was the need to know each other. And that, the, and Mapuche say, we Mapuche know what Chile is about. Chileans have no clue what Mapuches are about. So we saw, thought that the project in the south, the Kunu, was this first step that needed to be done before going into the second one. So what was going to be a two-step, a one-step process became a two-step process after the Veronica Figueroa Wencho 
told us about the tradition of the polis. She, she's a scholar that has studied many things, but among the things that was crucial, that this is a two-step project, not a one-step project. So the project in the South that brings together many traditions and logics of the Mapuche may work, may eventually work as this bridge or portal into the Mapuche world. And once the field is leveled, only then we may have a, the possibility to sit to the table and negotiate the terms of this existence of this living together. So if you change the words Mapuche and Chileans and put their rich and poor, left and right, have and have nots, you name it. It makes sense that, for example, one of the biggest challenges in Chile right now after the social explosion is that the rich and the poor do not know each other. Our cities are so segregated that the others are always a threat. For the poor, the rich are a threat because they are abusive. For the, for the rich, the poor are a threat because they are violent. So, it, again, one clue to be able to write these new rules of the game of the Constitution, so before jumping into that, let's get to know each other. And that's what I, it, I, there are some, some people that have talked about this project of the Biennale, saying oh, this, this kind of uh, obvious thing, let's get to know each other, as if it was a kind of very uh, banal or... Well, sometimes the, the deepest things like getting to know each other cannot be taken for granted at all. And sometimes the solutions are rather simple. But one thing is to say it, another thing is to implement it. So the real knowledge of each other, being able to put yourself in the shoes of the other one, that that in the end is about communication, it's not just information, that I, I get information about the other. I get communicated with the other, it's one of the challenges, and, and that two-step process appeared from dealing with this project, and that's one of the things I, I shared with this uh, Constitutional Convention, because I, we, we thought it was useful that sometimes the solutions are counterintuitive. There was somebody over there, and then I go back here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you have answered um, a part of my question that I want to ask. Um, uh, I remember uh, when you were the, the curator of Biennale di Venezia five years ago, um, the banner, if you remember, was a lady on a ladder uh, in the middle, middle of nothing to find a different horizon. And I think today we feel exactly like uh, that lady. So. I think the question that uh, Mr. Uh, Hashim Sakis wants to ask, um, you have answered in this project in a different way. You have changed the question. If uh, we want to live together, and then the answer is yes in your question. So I wanted to know your opinion about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's interesting that before assuming that the question the assumption is, yes, that we want to live together. And I think as an elephant in the room is, do we want to live together? Uh, it's a fair question to ask. Uh, for those that answer yes, I guess, now do you move into the, the how? Now in, in understanding the instruments, the tools that we will have to develop and put into motion to be able to guarantee. But I guess that what the pandemic showed is that it's not that you can choose not to live together with others. The them is not possible anymore. It's already an us. So I may want to seclude myself in my own world from, a, let's say, an economical point of view. That's perfectly possible. You live in a club. You don't even look at what the reality of society is. And you can create the boundary to uh, leave the others, them, outside. With the pandemic, that's not possible anymore. It's, all, it's us. It's not a choice. So I guess that, again, if we double-click on the question, it's so 
in, intuition in capturing the waves that are dealing with our time, it proved that you, it's an unscapable question. Not to mention the environmental emergency. Is we will have to live together no matter what. So again, that the type of questions that we're dealing with have made the them not so pos not much possible anymore. From now on, us, it's an inevitable condition. And there, you move into the how. And in the how, we may have some clues as designers and as architects. Over here. I thought we want to see each other. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just um, thinking how, when you showed the, the, the video, I was just thinking how, based on your experience, can we use this to the other parts of the world where the conflict is almost the same? The, the first thought that I had is like Palestine and what's happening there. It's also all, already, I mean, I, I think it's more than the land or the earth, or whatever you call it, but how do you think we can use this? I don't want to go to Australia with other uh, uh, other tribes to call them, or other people, not to, to give the names, but how we can use this to go there and solve a different or other questions that we have. It's like almost on the other side of the world, but I think it's similar or the same question. Again, I, I think it, it didn't took us that long to be able to understand that when doing, doing the project with, for, for, with, with more than four, the Mapuche, uh, there were some clues for issues that we had between Chileans. I mean, it was, I mean, the Mapuche kind of, when this social explosion took place in October 2019, they can, that, before that, in September, by, by far the biggest problem on the news and everybody was the Mapuche. When the social blast took place in October, they kind of stood back and they were just looking as us Chileans fighting each other, killing each other. Uh, so it became clear rather soon that from what used to be a conflict, there may be some clues for solution. And I guess it's not that different from what m may be happening in other places. The question of being recognized, the, pre the question of being visible, and that's part of the inequalities that are not only economical that I was referring to. The, in principle in Europe, economical inequalities are not an issue. The, the distance between income, uh, it's, uh, you couldn't tell or you wouldn't tell that from there some kind of threat will come. But the symbolic dimensions, the cultural dimensions, the inequalities there are brutal and they're very hard to measure. Am I somebody that when look at the street can feel proud about myself or I'm always being looked at as suspicious? I guess one of the biggest challenges that the developed world is, is facing is that to substitute su suspicious, being suspicious to the benefit of the doubt. Normally, we don't give the benefit of the doubt to the other. It's a threat, and because of that, it's a suspicious uh, individual, a culture. Religious, ethnic, uh, immigration has created this kind of more invisible inequalities, and that is a, a fountain of conflict. Uh, and again, how to tackle that issue? Well, we, we go back to the Mapuche again. Well, first, get to know each other the different ethnic groups, the different cultures that are living within the city, if I don't get to know it, it's a threat. It's them. The moment we create, and this, there may be a role in city design, in public space. I mean, public spaces are an opportunity to get to know each other. Sports, as, as it happened there, it's an opportunity to get to know each other. It's not guaranteed, but again, the moment you understand that some things that is been on being a threat on you is just a different way to look at the world, then you may lower your defenses and give the benefit of the doubt mutually. It's not just in one direction, it's in both directions. 
And once you've created that leveling in the field, and again, inequality is not being only economical, but mainly cultural, as, or symbolic, or intangible, only then you may lower the pressure so that such an explosion is not the only way out and create the conditions for once you're recognized and your question of identity of something from somebody valuable for society may then answer the question of how to live together. Well, the, the, the leveled field is one of the conditions. Cities may offer that opportunity. At the same time, there that, that living together very close, it creates the friction, but it may also carry the solution because cities do have many dimensions that are, can perform as a shortcut toward equality. Without having to touch income, you can level quality of life. You can get to know each other. Public space, public transportation, infrastructure, housing, are these opportunities for leveling the field. Somebody. Um. Maybe I have two questions about the, the, maybe the consequence of this kind of projects in which uh, you are dealing with uh, traditions and uh, heritage from originary peoples. Uh, one thing is about uh, if maybe, maybe you answer it uh, during uh, uh, showing the photos of conversation with Mapuche people, but it's about um, how do you deal with, for example, the danger of uh, cultural appropriation that could be at the basis in projects that deal with traditions, cultural heritages, and so on? And also because I, I know that Mapuche people, is not, it's not easy to, 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 to go to talk about and building something. And the other question is about, uh, in this context of, of design, of uh, innovation in Milan, uh, I'm just wondering uh, what could be maybe an, uh, 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 a learning about something like this project in which we are dealing with racism, uh, interculturality and so on, and how could be uh, useful or, or interesting in, in this context of innovation applied in the design or in a economic development of a society, because this is a fear that has to do with with profit. Huh? That's yes. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm just, just reacting and thinking out, out loud uh, now regarding cultural appropriation. I would say two things. First, if they already had this type of architecture, then you can appropriate it. What if that architecture never existed? You have to invent it. So it would be, the threat would be cultural pertinence or cultural invention. You can appropriate only something that already existed. When that didn't exist, the challenge is slightly different. And I will talk about why we were so nervous when doing this project, because this was by far the project in which we had no idea what to do. There were no clues, no references, no nothing for how to do something that could be felt as if it had always been there. So, if there was a threat, it was not that. The second thing is that I would say that cultural appropriation is when you take somebody from a community, a group, uh, you take knowledge, traditions, whatever, extract it, and that extraction is used for the advantage of somebody else somewhere else. So the, the notion of extraction, I would say, it's, uh, uh, that applies not only as cultural appropriation, I guess that the biggest question we do have in extractive industries, mining, or, or I mean, oh, I mean, the, the environmental emergency that we're facing is a consequence of extraction, where you apply a knowledge, a productive activity, somewhere else to the benefit that, of people that is not in the place where this has been produced. Otherwise, then people can regulate uh, 
the in negative impacts of an activity because at least there's some benefits being produced. If the benefits of abstract stock market somewhere else uh, because of a commodity, then the negative impacts can of the, in a community cannot be regulated. They're, they're, they're separated, physically separated, and then, of course, you can't create as much harm as you want because you're not even aware where that harm is produced until it now is touching everybody. So the consequences of mining in Australia are felt by the whole planet. Uh, so that's the, the other dimension I would, I would refer to that type of threat or challenge or put it in a positive way of care that one should have while working in, in, this, uh, in this type of questions. The way we found the way we approached was, so again, thinking out loud, it has a couple of clues. First, as I was saying, we put at the service of the question some of the knowledge that we have. And that knowledge is to be able to transform into form, into place, into the built environment, forces that you identify that are cultural, traditional, Philosophical is a cosmology. There are resources involved. So, what we, as I, I mentioned here, I very quickly was seen on the on the PowerPoint when I was skipping slides. They already had a project. What the community wanted was to have a cultural center plus an auditorium plus some market plus some small hotel. So it, it was a huge range of uh, needs that they had. And they already had a building, and the original question was, can you make the municipal permissions for this building? Uh, and the moment they be, we, we, as an outsider, and this is another thing, as an outsider, you may have the advantage of the big picture. I mean, you, the risk of an outsider is that you miss the subtleties, that you miss the context, that you may miss uh, rules that are in there that have to be respected. And you, by coming from outside, w just walk on top of that without being carefully enough. But an outsider may, off may have an advantage that you don't miss the big picture. Our big picture was, I mean, this is about having the municipal permission for this building when the territory around is, uh, is very violent. So maybe here before doing a building, there's something else that needs to be built, which is trust. But the benefit of the doubt. And for that, uh, we understood that this process had to follow some steps. Before doing something or negotiating something, let's get to know each other. That, that step backwards, we said, in this list of programs that you have, this looks more like a small city, not as a big building. As, as cities, they need to have a foundational act. The foundational act of the cities in Latin America was the law of India's, you know, agreed three by three with a square at the center, the symbolic presence of the church, of the king, and of, of, of God, whatever. Well, that foundational act is not pertinent in here. It has to come from a different context. But Mapuche did not have cities. They, they do follow. Uh, they... they they're extremely good at reading landscape. They read things that we don't read. And that's why, I mean, if, if there's a, a culture from which to learn about the sustainability is the Mapuche, from the herbs that are medicinal to understanding when uh, land is, is uh, um, it's ill, um, they know how to read things that we just miss. Well, in any case, it would be impossible that a foundational act is done without incorporating that cosmology. That is not the only one. It's one of the two, at least. The other one being Chileans, Westerners, whatever you want to call it. So how do we do that first foundational act? And this was the moment where we made this huge jump into the void. I may go backwards.
to that, that picture. We went to the territory, to a process of an immersion. We understood that whatever we thought we had to do was not the case. We had to do something different. And the first meeting we had when we went back to present our conclusion of this process of interaction, uh, and we were extremely nervous, uh, we were not bringing the building they were expecting. We brought this thing, this stick model that had nothing to do with the building they were expecting. Yet the first reaction was, that's it. We don't know what it is, but that's it. What is in that moment, I have no idea. I would say intuition is, is and this is something that comes from our professions in innovation and, uh, and uh, is that the, the role of intuition where you know more, than, more things than you consciously know. You've got your things there. Uh, and of course, it was a very risky moment um, because we could have been, I mean, once again, Wincas, Chileans coming with a thing that was not what we asked for. Uh, but it was not what happened. It happened something different. And I, my, my guess is that we understood that the first approach was symbolic, not economic. We, we Chileans have always thought of the government, not us, the, as a society necessarily. But, oh, this is the poorest region in the country. So let's give some economic uh, support. Even if well-intentioned, that's missing the point. Again, it's trying to answer well the wrong question. The question is about first know that we exist. So it's a symbolic question. By, by this thing, what we did and what we'll describe the attributes of the design here is that we wanted to make it visible. The first act had to be not a void as in uh, squares in, in the law of India's, but something vertical, not horizontal. Vertical so that it could be seen. The moment you see something, then you can I identity begins to have a place. The question is that that didn't exist. Well, it's based on the circular footprint of religious spaces of Mapuche that disappear every season. When they celebrate the Wetripantu, which is the new year in the Southern Hemisphere, new year should be celebrated in June, not in January. Uh, that's part of the cultural uh, colonization, not appropriation, that we have suffered in the South. Uh, but they have very clear that the new year for Mapuche is between the 21st and the 24th of June, which is the shortest day of the year, the same way it's understood in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, that's to start with, that's a one shift. So it's based on that almost circular space of, the, of ceremonial religious space, I guess circular spaces are connected to the fact that Mapuche is an oral culture. It's not a written culture, and in oral cultures, the mo for example, this space over here, uh, and I was uh, talking be before, we were commenting before, that when I have somebody in my back here, it's very, for you, it's unfair that I'm, I'm look you're looking always, we may be looking at my face over there, but I'm not referring to you. Was this space designed in an oral culture, would have been circular and I wouldn't have been in the center, I would be on the periphery. So that I can look at everybody else's face. And that's in an oral culture matters. For living together, that matters. The maximum distance is the one where my voice without these technical devices can be heard. Uh, so that gives a measure for this kind of, of circular space. Given it's a ceremonial space, we had to place 80 fires in the perimeter of the 80 communities that come together to celebrate. And in a circle, there was not enough perimeter to have 80 fires. So from above, this thing is more or less a circle. It's not slightly a circle. But what I, want this, the, what I wanted to say here is that the first proposal there was something that never existed even though it was based from on the circular footprint yet the the sticks the the way to structure them it was new um, 
but we, we brought a kind of three-dimensional sketch that was the second question after the, that's it. The second reaction was, but it's wrong. What do you mean it's wrong? Yeah, because this has to be oriented where the sun rises. Yeah, it is oriented. I mean, one of the things we learned in the process was that east for Mapuche was very important, where the sun rises. So we oriented the project east. And one of the leaders of the community said, yeah, but on the 21st to the 24th of June, the sun doesn't rise in the east. It's slightly off. So uh, that's... The, East is an obstruction. The reality of the sunrise in that particular date is exactly over there. So we said to Fidel, well, change it. The model is unglued. You know something, I know other things. So I may know how to structure something vertical with things that will last and not disappear for the next season. But for example, what you have just said, you have that knowledge, and I need that knowledge to converge into this project. So the project itself became a, a parliament, a, a coyactun. So that I do, I say something, they respond with something. So design in that sense is a tool for conversation. It's unglued, and it's a sketch. It's not finished. So, and sketches are these things that you have some things clear, but not everything clear. So the the just a few. Crucial things are clear, but then it leaves room for a dialogue. So the process of design was a dialogue in itself, and this is something that we, we put there in the Biennale. This is not a project about the less is more, you know, a minimum intervention. This is a project about the more or less. This project is more or less a circle, is more or less oriented east. That more or lessness. I would say it's the way to create a system that is open enough so that it can, we can use it as a tool for a negotiation, for conversation, for convergence of, of knowledges. That's why it's not cultural appropriation. Because we ourselves, we, we ourselves wouldn't have been able to create it alone they also, themselves wouldn't have been able to create it alone. It's only because we met that we create something there. To our surprise, and I think we have very little time left because there's a connection to, so this is the last thing. To our surprise, when it was already built and we went to the south to uh, proper deliver the project that will be opened, next month with the communities, with, it, with everything. And this has to follow very careful steps. And when we went there, again, the, the leaders there said, but you know what, this project is not anymore, not even a symbolic foundation of the small city. This project is a memorial. And the reason why it's a memorial is because the name of the city, Lonco Che, Lonco is head. Che, people. What we all thought, it was that, well, this was a territory where important people, the head of the community, uh, lived here. It's, it's known as a region with very wise leaders. Um, so maybe that's the, why the name from Longcoche comes from. Well, this, this guy, again, was Fidel, said that he had a dream. And in his, in his dream, he remembered of an old story that was about the leaders that were once invited to a kind of negotiation of a parley. And in that parley, or, or whatever it was, they were taken, their heads were cut, and put on top of sticks. And that story had kind of got lost. But he remembered the story from the old through the dream. So this project now, with these sticks, was the memorial of the heads of those leaders that now have, were honored. That, that's why they have a slice on, the, on the, and the, the bigger stick. And that slice is painted in blue because they're, uh, they're uh, facing the, the, um, the sky. How on earth would have, would have been us possibly know that old story that not even then remembered? And I guess that this is, when something like that appears, 
it can't be that far. It can't be more far from cultural appropriation because it's a way, it's your, you're dissolving yourself into something to be able to capture wavelengths that are not rational. And I'm not going esoteric here because our practice is very rational, budget, timeline, public policies, it's about the very tight budgets and, and all that. But we, all re we also know that these other dimensions of the human condition uh, have to enter the system. Otherwise, it's not life anymore, it's just whatever, survival. Uh, so I guess that, um, again, the, this question of, of being careful with, um, with what you know and, and what you intuitively apprehend uh, make this be a very far from, from the threat, which I, I agree. I mean, it, it, one should be careful not to take advantage of something there, but it was not the case because that, that something was not there before. What's last comment? There was an, an, an article, but, but again, some uh, scholars from anthropology and architecture that, uh, again, were saying cultural appropriation. Uh, before going on, on Wednesday, last Wednesday to the, conventional consti the uh, constitutional convention, um, I called the leader, Mario Mila, is an old very respected uh, leader of the community. And, and I said, look, I'm going to present the project in the convention. Uh, is, is it okay with you? Because it's a, it's a very delicate matter. It's not that you can just bring something that uh, if it's not the community that I, I felt I had to ask. Uh, and, if, and he said, of course you have to. Uh, because here we have explored a path. As he, he's talking about in the last part of the video, this may be a path. It's not the only path. It could be one for a peaceful approachment. Uh, but you have to share it. And, um, I said, but when, you know what? I received this article by this uh, uh, ladies. Uh, and we've been thinking, should we write something back or not? He was very pissed off by somebody speaking in the name of them, defending them, that's another way of not showing respect. Uh, there's a huge knowledge, wisdom, more than knowledge. Uh, and again, if we, we don't stop, particularly the, 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 the intermediate level of, of commentators of, of society, that in the name of others uh, want to put an, an agenda uh, our task is to let those others speak for themselves. Uh, and if not, ask them if it's okay that I speak about my experience. I'm not being there an ambassador of the Mapuche world. I'm just sharing what we had to do to find a way for a peaceful coexistence. That's my field of knowledge and it may offer some clues. And I think that's another important uh, um, lesson from this project. I think we're, we're almost over, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.